Wednesday evening program. I'm trying to give that a little bit of a turbo boost, bring a few more people in on Wednesday evenings. Been kind of slim in the past couple of months, but I bring some more people in. So I'd like you to check mark on the things that you might be interested in on a Wednesday evening. Right now we have the Bible study going on at 6, and our Wednesday evening service at 7. We're allowing you some options here that maybe might bring some of you more in on a regular basis on a Wednesday evening. So I'm asking you to fill that out. Uh, go ahead and put it in the offering guest when you're done, or hand it to me afterwards. Look at these beautiful songs. These are dumb pretty. Thanks, Chuck and Kim and the family. Those are in celebration for Beth and Larry's anniversary, which is on Tuesday, 59 years. So, congratulations. <laughs> people are involved. We've been getting some good reports for Beth yet from Rochester. We still want to keep Larry in our prayers, of course, as too for strength and healing. Uh, after the service today, the Future Planning Committee has a presentation for the congregation in regards to what the, the findings that they've had and the stuff that they've discussed and they've come up with uh, that have come out of the congregational surveys. So come on afterwards, besides having the goodies that are always down there with the coffee, and uh, here's the presentation that the Future Planning Committee has got for us. All right, I think we are ready to go. If I could have you rise as you are able... Our first hymn for today is God of Our Life, All Glorious Lord. We are working on the green hymnal today, and our hymn for right now is number 270.
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and end us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a call to ordained minister of Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ, and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
And what is happening here is what sometimes happens, I guess, within the church or whatever. But the people of Israel have been making some statements that uh, the Lord was very upset about. He said they have been saying that um, it doesn't make any difference what, what they did because the Lord passed the sins of the father onto the children, and the children would then suffer the consequences and so on down the line. Uh, and it wouldn't make any difference what they did. They would not be forgiven. So the Lord goes to Ezekiel and he says to the people the following. And that's where we start at chapter 18 uh, of Ezekiel. <coughs> then another message came to me from the Lord. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. As surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel, for all the people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. Continuing on verse 25. Yet you say the Lord isn't doing what's right. Listen to me, O people of Israel. Am I the one not doing what's right, or is it you? When righteous people turn from their righteous behavior and start doing sinful things, they will die for it. Yes, they will die because of their sinful deeds. And if wicked people turn from their wickedness, obey the law, and do what is just and right, they will save their lives. They will live because they thought it over and decided to turn from their sins. Such people will not die. And yet the people of Israel keep saying, the Lord isn't doing what's right. O people of Israel, it is you who are not doing what is right, not I. Therefore I will judge each of you, O people of Israel, according to your actions, says the Sovereign Lord. Repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Put all your rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O people of Israel? I don't want you to die, says the Sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. The psalm for today is Psalm 25, found on page 226 in your green hymnal, or you may follow in up on the screen. <clears throat> page 226. I will read the even if you will respond with the odd verses. Turn to you, to you, O Lord, I will lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let the man who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the holy. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, forgive my sin, for it is great. The second reading is found in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Starting with the first verse through the fourth, and then continuing on the 14th through the 18th. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish and don't try to impress others. 
Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in the others too. And continuing on uh, with verse 14, do everything without complaining and arguing, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life, then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. It's the end of the second reading. Please rise for the gospel. <laughs> Denial 
of the obvious. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So, they have no excuse for not knowing God. <clears throat> I say all this as a backdrop for our scripture text for today. The religious <laughs> leaders of Jesus' day were full of unbelief and also in denial of the obvious. They steadfastly refused to believe in Jesus no matter how much evidence there was. And so they asked Jesus, in verse 23, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? These religious leaders denied that Jesus was from God. And in response to these questions to his authority, Jesus then says in verses 24 through 25, I'll tell you by <coughs> what authority I do these things if you answer one question. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, or was it merely human? Now, th this was a brilliant maneuver by Jesus, because John had said that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that he is also the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. Listen to these words from John the Baptist. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, about who John the Baptist said Jesus was. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but... I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the, the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Wow. What more authority could you have? If the religious leaders believed that John's ministry and words were from heaven, there would be no question about Jesus' authority. However, that was not the case. So the religious leaders were caught in a bind. Verses 25 through 26 tell us what happened as they were wrangling with these issues amongst themselves. Verse 25. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask us why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, we'll be mocked because the people believed John was a prophet. These guys are admitting here that they didn't even believe John. <laughs> And the truth is, folks, that, that if a person really doesn't want to believe something, they will always find a way to deny it. So being caught in this quandary, and not wanting to admit that they were even in a quandary, the religious leaders state in verse 27, we don't know. And with that response to work with, Jesus then replies in verse 28, Then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus says this because the religious leaders had already been told and said amongst themselves that they would not believe it. So Jesus knew that they would not believe even if he told them again. So now I would like for us to take a look at the next passage of verses after our gospel text for today. In verses 28 through 32, Jesus tells another parable. He says this, But what do you think about this? 
A man with two sons told the older boy, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, No, I won't go. But later, he's changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, You go. And he said, Yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which one of the two obeyed his father? They replied, The first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you two. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. While tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, yet you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. So when those sinners believed John, they then repented and were baptized. And they <coughs> entered the kingdom of heaven. Ahead of the Pharisees who did not believe John's message and balked at it. The lowest of sinners believed and repented. However, those who were steeped in the scriptures did not believe. They claimed that they obeyed the Father and went into his field. But in reality, they didn't. Meanwhile, the sinners who had first rebelled against the Father changed their minds. They obeyed and did the Father's bidding. They actually went into the vineyard before the religious leaders who were still standing outside the gate. It was a shocking reversal. Those who claimed to be following God appeared to be going into the vineyard. However, they never actually went. And those who appeared to be far from God were now carrying out his will and doing his work. In his book, The Faith, Chuck Colson tells many stories about men in prison who had committed crimes, but who then came to Christ and were thoroughly converted. Now, no one would have guessed that some of these men would one day be devout followers of Jesus. But one such story was the account of a man named Danny. Danny had been a fighter, and he was in prison for murdering a man named John Gilbert. But one day, someone gave him a Bible, and as he read it, he found himself being attracted to the Jesus he was reading about. So Chuck Colson tells the story in his book this way. The more Danny felt drawn to Jesus, the more he saw himself in a new light. He was used to comparing himself to the guy in the next bar stool, and that way he usually didn't look so bad. But when he compared himself to Jesus, he started to feel afraid. This man who never raised his fists scared him as nobody else ever had. He also read passages about people being cast into outer darkness, where there was uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Danny knew something about darkness. <coughs> Lying on his bunk at night, Danny began to review his whole life, horrified by the person he had become. He saw himself living for his next drink, his next coke party. He saw himself using women. His last girlfriend had been good to him, but he would have thrown her away for the next quarter ounce of coke. In fact, he probably had. That next Sunday, when the guard called out for people who wanted to be let out of their cells to attend chapel, Danny shouted, cell 16. <coughs> but he sat like a stone to the service and hearing little. He was there to ask a question. Afterward, he approached Chaplain Bob Hansen and asked him if the passages he had read about outer darkness were really about hell. Yes, said the chaplain. Then I'm in big trouble, Danny said. When you get back to your cell, get on your knees by your bunk, said the chaplain. Confess your sins to God and pray for Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And Danny did just that. In his cell, he knelt and confessed that he was a sinner and asked Christ to be his Lord, as he did. He kept remembering horrible things he had done. And the memories brought both pain and an eagerness to be forgiven. 
talking to God seemed like carrying a, on a conversation with someone he had missed all along without knowing it. He could almost hear God replying to a silence that echoed his sorrow and embraced it. Danny not only felt heard, he also felt understood and received. He slept that night and every night afterward. Now, Chuck Colson goes on to say that in his book, eventually, Danny was released from prison, got married, and had five children. Danny then graduated from Wheaton College and was ordained. He went on to work with troubled kids in Boston and then was offered a job as a prison chaplain. Danny had been very far from the Father, but then one day turned around and began to work in the Father's vineyard. Now there's, there's lots of stories like Danny's. And conversely, there are also many stories of religious leaders in our time whose lives are full of hypocrisy and lies. We have all read their stories and heard about their corruption and fall. What appears to be isn't always what it really is. Those who appear to be working for God and living for Him are not always the ones who are really working for Him. And sometimes those who appear to be far from God are not always as far away as they seem. So Jesus' words from last Sunday's Gospel text ring true. So those who are last now will be first, then, and those who are first will be last. As Jesus says to the religious leaders, he says this in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 7. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. For they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. <coughs> Way too many people see this whole thing about God as a matter of keeping rules. And what we fail to see is that God wants to have a relationship with us. Even if we haven't kept the rules, God will forgive us for not keeping the rules. However, there is no forgiveness for not having a relationship with him. Forgiveness is only something that opens the way for coming to God so that we can have a relationship with him. So those who only see it as a matter of keeping the rules do not enter the vineyard because they can always find ways around the rules. However, those who understand that it is a matter of loving the Father and being in a relationship with him will not only enter the vineyard, they will do it joyfully. The Pharisees had reduced God to a set of rules so that they no longer saw him as a person. No wonder they couldn't accept Jesus for who he was. Because it was who Jesus was that gave him his authority. Folks, there will always be a question about matters of faith. But that's a good thing because it means you're going to keep me around for a while so that I can help you through that. But at the same time, you should never be inviting those doubts to dinner and going, giving them a room to stay in. Sometimes it is good to doubt your doubts. And it's even better. It's even better to abandon ourselves to the truth of who Jesus is and what God has done for us through him. Church, you were born just not to believe in God, but to love him and live in a joyful relationship with him. And that's what it means to have belief and obedience. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise that you are always right outside the door of our hearts, knocking and waiting for us to let you in. Help us, Lord, to have faith and trust just like a little child. Ignite your Holy Spirit fire within each one of us so that we can be racing to work in your harvest fields just like the children from our church race down to learn about you in Sunday school. And we pray this in the holy name of your Son, Jesus.
Our next hymn is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. We're still in the great hymnal, number 294.
And Lord, we give you the praise and glory for that. Lord, we ask you for, for continued vision, continued discernment and guidance in how you want your church to work. Lord, give us that guidance and discernment. Put it on our hearts, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father God, we pray for all those churches who are trying to stand upon the truth of your holy gospel that is through your son, Jesus. Give them the strength to stand strong. Give strength to the congregations, to the church leaders, and especially to the pastors, Lord. Protect them from any kind of evil influence, whether that be from the media and sometimes even from other churches. Lord, give them the strength to stand strong to find your holy truth. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for your healing touch. There's a number of people on our hearts at this time who need that healing touch. Some of that healing is in bodies, and some of it is also in minds and in hearts. Father yes. God, we pray for you, Jehovah Rapha, to come to each one of those people who are on our hearts at this time. Bring your healing touch. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all the healing you have done in this congregation. There's walking miracles standing in these pews right now. And Lord, we give you the thanks and praise for that healing. Lord, we, we continue to give you for the thanks and praise for the healings that are yet to come. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for this nation. We've turned away from you, Lord. And as a congregation, we promise to pray for this nation. We promise to pray for our nation's leaders that they will turn back to you. Lord, you promised in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, Verse 14, that if we turn from our wicked ways, you will hear our prayers and you will hear us by our Lord, we stand upon this. And so we pray for this, this nation. We pray for this nation. We, we pray for the nation's leaders that we'll be voting for in a couple of months to come, Lord. We pray that we'll be voting for people who will be doing your will and not a will of their own agenda. And Lord, we pray for our nation's leaders who are there now. That they also too will make decisions according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those soldiers who are fighting for those freedoms that, that we enjoy here. Protect them, Lord. Bring them home safe. Reunite them with their families, Lord. And then help us to stand by them as they, they as they've stood by for us all these years, Lord. Help us to be able to help them with their healing. That's in body, mind, or spirit. Help them be able to transition back into society. Help us be able to find, it, find them jobs and let them heal. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for all those soldiers who are fighting on the front line of your gospel truth. All those missionaries that we support individually and as a congregation. Protect them, Lord. Protect their health, Lord, and the health of their families. Protect them from any kind of human evil. Protect them from any kind of evil of Satan, Lord. And Lord, please provide them with the resources that they need to do those ministries you have called each of them to do. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Does anyone who has any prayers that they'd like to make at this time, please go ahead and say it. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we ask that we are united as Paul talks about in today's lesson, of supporting one another, not only in this church, but across the nation, as Christians come under more and more fire. We need to stand strong, give us the courage to do so, to make decisions that will further your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah.
your hands, O oh Lord. We commit all for whom we pray. Those who we pray for our Father, and those who we pray for in our hearts. Trusting in the mercy of your Son, Jesus. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share that peace of God with one another. Thank you. 
upon you and give you his everlasting strength and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Kids ready to go? Off they go. It's time for Sunday school at this time. Kids, head on down. Have a great time. And uh, the rest of us children of God, it's one more hymn to sing. going to be a change in the... The program here, we're going to sing number 557, but it's going to be the hymn, Let All Things Now Living. Now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.